WNYC-TV presents About the Arts with Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Welcome to About the Arts. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guests today are two of the more gifted American playwrights. It's a very real pleasure to welcome John Guare, the author of the prize-winning House of Blue Leaves and the new Landscape of the Body, and Albert Inarato, the author of Gemini, the Transfiguration of Ben Oblimpi, and the new Ulysses in Traction. Both of you actually have a great deal in common, including what I would think has often been described as fiendish comic visions. With humanity in general and the American family as the target, are you trying to tell us something? No, I'll tell myself something. And what is that message? No, you just try. I think it's just trying to go through one's own mazes and see where one is right now, to see just how one got to be at this point right now, just examine back there. It's, I don't think it's about trying to tell anyone anything. Mr. Inarada? I hate to talk about that sort of thing. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, yes. It's very difficult to say. You know, I don't, uh, I don't consider myself anything about the family. I mean... It is in those uh, in those plays, but in my new play, Ulysses in Traction, there is no family. I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's not something that, that one can speak about. I think. Yeah. My new play is about an absence of family, which I mean, that's the th it's one of the I didn't realize that that till last night, listening, watching it, at, this, at the first preview we had, but that it's about what happens when there is no family. No, s it's about totally structureless people whose relations are totally unstructured. Your new play is it. Joe Paps, that's another thing that the two of you share in common. You've referred to him as your salvation. What is your special relationship to Joe Paps theatrical enterprises? Well, I mean, it's, he produces plays. It's as simple as that. It's most producers uptown are not, I mean, I think what Albert, I mean, Albert is being produced by the Circle Rep, I'm being produced by the, Sh you know, by the Shakespeare Festival, is that commercial producers are no longer interested in producing plays. They don't produce plays. When, After we did Two Gentlemen of Verona, Pap and I had had a falling out where I didn't want to work there, and I had stayed three years away from there. We tried to start a new theater in Nantucket. I went to Chicago to work. We went to Williamstown, and it's you can work, but there's no way to get back to New York. I mean, by the time I had the space that it took one play, I had last year Marco Polo sings a solo. It took three years for that to get from Nantucket to New York, and Rich and Famous, it took a year and a half to get it from Chicago to New York, and in that time, my feelings about the plays had changed. I had changed. The plays were different. It's quite. It's it's very very important, just as a writer, to be connected to a theater where uh, somebody who is producing you, who is interested in you as a playwright, not in you and your latest play or a play. Well, I don't. I don't have a relationship with Joe Pat personally, but that's. I have a Rockefeller. Aren't you a Rockefeller? I have a Rockefeller person there, but that doesn't mean that there's an interest in my work. But uh, I respect Joe Papp a great deal, and I think that he's done the wonders for uh, playwrights in the new, the new American theater. Uh, my relationship right now is with the circle rep, Marshall Mason, and so on. And they've, been, I, they've had a similar relationship with them that John has had with Joe, in the sense that they're very uh, supportive, and they, they make a commitment to a given writer rather than a given play, which is very important, because uh, when you make a commitment to a given play, when that play exhausts itself or, or doesn't go, that's that, and you're a stranger. But in these organizations, you can be nurtured as a human being and as a writer. And uh, that's very important, I think, for a career. Well, how do we nourish dr dramatists in our country? Uh, much has been said about this very hospitable environment that's out there across the country. You say that commercial producers are not very interested in producing plays of a certain kind in Any New York. Uh, as far as they're only interested in importing plays, and they're ve very, very rarely interested in producing well, brand new plays. they're interested in money. And money. They're I mean, interested in money. They're it's not interested in plays. It's a business. They're interested in, a pro in literally when it becomes the property. I mean, it could be detergent. I mean, it's a, it's a commercial mentality. I are mean, it's you like suggesting that some plays off-Broadway are not commercial successes? Of course, Chorus Line and Hair immediately spring to mind. You couldn't ask for something more commercially yeah, but viable they both than that. But, I mean, but, but they both started, at, for example, at the public theater. I mean, no it's, a, it's an incredible lesson to learn that no commercial producer would trust Michael Bennett and Marvin Hamlish and Ed Cleveland and a bunch of dancers, as Joe did, to say, okay, 
spend eight months and come up with and show me what you have. Take eight months. I trust you as, I trust you as artists. Here, take this space and stay in there for eight months and come out, stay in there as long and come out when you're ready. And they came out eight months later. Well, I'll tell you, back, I can uh, give you my experience in my play Gemini, which is running on Broadway and has already had a substantial run for an American play by a new American writer without music, uh, <laughs> was turned down by every single commercial producer in this city, by every single, single minor commercial producer in this city, and by every regional theater. And they all had the same response. Our Which nonprofit way? regional theaters, as well as the commercial producers, it's not commercial. Because regional theaters share in, in the writer's subsidiary rights. If they do a non-commercial play, which will end with them, they make less money than if they do a play that will come to Broadway and make a big success and become a movie and become a television show. So they, com regional theaters, nonprofit, grant-supported regional theaters wouldn't do it because they didn't think it had a commercial future. And commercial producers wouldn't do it because they didn't think it had a commercial pu producer at Future, and the play started off off Broadway, moved to a at Playwrights Horizons. At Playwrights Horizons, four times in six months, and yeah, each time went, to larger houses. And it was an accident. It was always an accident. It was always a last-minute thing. But the thing is that it's turned out to be quite a commercial play, and yet it was turned down by every commercial producer. The thing is, this kind of commercial mentality interferes with people's judgment. Of course, it's a commercial play. I always thought it was. It obviously is. I mean, all, you can sit and watch an audience. Of course it is. It has a story. It has characters people recognize and identify with. It's funny. It has all the commercial rules in it. But you said somehow commercial producers didn't see that. Does success on Broadway mean success to you? Does one have to make a success on Broadway uh, to make it in the theater? Wait, I don't understand the question. Well, you're making a, a great distinction between the commercial mentality of the Broadway producer. I think that we have to give Jerry Schoenfeld's a line equal time for a moment. He's often been, uh, he's often said, uh, there's no profit like non-profit. Um, and the contrast between the commercial theater, which is generally thought of as Broadway, and I think the cliche that one makes it on Broadway and then one is a success in the theater. Does that no longer hold true? I think the main thing is I think we've seen too many people destroyed by that. I mean, you say, I mean, just for example, in our own lifetime, I mean, you know, Tennessee Williams, who was our greatest playwright, who was after he stopped turning out what he, what they felt were commercially feasible mm -hmm. plays, was just dismissed. And his later plays, I mean, one day will be discovered and appreciated and used, and they'll learn how to be performed. They're extraordinary pieces of work, but nobody was ever interested in. Pe producers stopped being interested in his work after it got to, uh, after it stopped being, uh, after Cat and Hot and Roof, and s there were no longer Streetcar Named Desire, that they were, it was him moving into new fields. I think that what's more important is, is the next play. I don't want to have to expend all that energy trying to get a play on. It's terrific if, if you have a play running on Broadway. It means that you get a kind of, yes, because I mean, you write plays, it means that your play is connected to an audience, which is what you're trying to do, and it's, but it's the pressures under which the play is born and is grown, and you can't, I mean, it's impossible, I think, to, to start a new play on Broadway with the pressures of rewrites or whatever it is on Broadway with somebody saying, hey, listen, we've got a theater party coming tomorrow night, we've got 1,500 people we're trying to get there, you know, the unions are coming, if we, if we don't make our nut this week, we'll be kicked out of the theater, or whatever, it's, it's where you want to work, where you want to say it. Okay, we trust you. Take as long as you need or as short as you need. What, what do you want? Do you ever write a play that is meant to be read or must plays be seen? Plays are seen. Brecht is right. He said the play is the production. A play is something that is to be produced. You mentioned, uh, Mr. Nerato, that among the rejectors of your now widely acclaimed Gemini was the regional theater. And certainly we are led to believe it is a very hospitable audience. Oh, uh, it's nonsense. I, I think it's a hospitable audience. I think the fools who run those theaters are not. I think there's a distinction between the audience in America and, and the mediocrities who are careerists in ripping off the so-called so theaters. I mean, it's the easiest thing in the world. Those are very strong words. Tell us what you mean. It's the easiest thing in the world to pull wool over the eyes of people who give money. I mean, it's very, very easy. To f if you ever applied for a grant, I don't know if John's had this experience, but if you ever have ever applied for a grant, you know, you can do all kinds of things you can do to get the grant. I mean, people lie through the teeth all the time. And, on, and I mean, that's fine for individual artists who usually are desperate when they apply for grants. But, you know, there are, there are people who make careers uh, 
on ripping off public funds. I mean, right, there are also people who make careers on evaluating those applications, uh, and they well, weren't born yesterday either. I, unfortunately, I, have, I, I just think the whole system is rotten. I think the whole system is uh, pretentious, uh, oriented toward a very pompous coffee table view of art. Uh, it, there's a, a tremendous amount of confusion about the aesthetic, aesthetic value of theater. And uh, it's just nonsense. You travel through the regional theaters, you can see 18 awful productions of Hamlet, for example, and almost no productions of new American plays. And well I'm we a know real, another I, regional... I'm a, real, sorry. I'm a real iconoclast about this, unfortunately. Uh, I have a respect for the classics as great as anybody's, I suppose, maybe greater, because I know just how much better Shakespeare was than I am. But nonetheless, uh, I think that Shakespeare is dead and has been dead for 500 years and has had his innings. I think it's about time that people in the regional theaters made some kind of commitment to living plays See, and living writers. They don't want to do new because, play. because we live now. Shakespeare is dead. Well, it is I'm a risk. I'm alive, and John Guare is alive. You're talking about the risk, plays, e risk element. Well, I'm talking about, I see, our plays, our plays are about life that we are living, good or bad. Our plays may not last, I don't know. I don't mean economic risk only. I'm talking about aesthetic, aesthetic. intellectual, personal, well, precisely, social precisely. risk and, and, with the... And, and audience, and with audience... With the not uh, proven... Yes, and an audience who goes to the theater uh, is, bo is bored. I've seen it. I mean, I've, I've lived in places where regional theaters are the, is the only theater. And you go and you see an incredibly dull... Is there no good regional theater? In fact... Well, I'm not going to... I'm not going to make a speech. Of course, sometimes the production... Sometimes some of those Hamlet productions are good. <laughs> but the thing is that there are so many regional theaters that do not do new American plays. There's a very famous one that either does revivals or, or mediocre English plays uh, that are safe. There are lots of uh, regional theaters that do very little, that make very little contribution to a theater as a living art form. Because as soon as you become a museum and simply do Shaw or Shakespeare or a safe English play, which might as well be Shaw or Shakespeare, then, uh, then there's no kind of vitality. There's the audience is not seeing something they recognize. And, and they're being fed this kind of culture pablum. I think a distinction can be made between, say, music, which is relatively timeless, and the theater. Of course, you know, the Metropolitan Opera House, the same thing can be said that I'm saying. That is all they do is largely 19th century work. But there is something timeless about, about m and music. is but not, not about Shakespeare or Shaw? Not about the theater. The theater is a distinct, is a very different art form than music. It's Let's talk about the one regional theater that we know certainly has been very responsive to your work, and I'm thinking of Lake Forest. What I was your experience there? Well, again, it was... Uh, Perhaps you might explain why I uh, mentioned Lake Forest. Well, yes, because I had Rich and Famous play, pr started there three years ago, and uh, this year Landscape of the Body started there this year. I don't co think of, strange enough, I don't think of G Academy Festival th Theater r r produced by Bill Gardner in Lake Forest as a regional theater. I wouldn't, as such. I wouldn't it's not, either. That's, that's not theater. a regional theater because that's I was because so many of the productions there come to New York. I mean, it's Jason Robards and you know, and Colleen Dewhurst's mm -hmm. move of the misbegotten started there, and s Irene Worth's Sweet Bird mm -hmm. of Youth came. You know, is it's a that's much more of a of a, a of an extraordinary stock package house. I think perhaps you could make a distinction for us between regional theater and those places outside of New York that really are, in a sense, way stations on the way to New York. Often, are they? Do they help ensure box office success? Do they? Are they a trial run for things? No, I mean the worst thing about I mean about uh, you know new plays in the regional theater is is that unless somebody can get unless the theater can get the uh, can get the subsidiary rights for it, get the world premiere. See, they're only interested really in most cases in getting the world premiere because it looks good in getting grants. And if somebody else wants to do it, or somebody else has an option on it, then they don't want to touch it. No, that they won't. There was a, an extraordinary coup which Helen Merrill pulled off, actually, for a play called American Film, which will be coming into New York in March, where three of them agreed to do the first three time. originals, the first time, because until then, the regional theaters would not do a play if it had been done. This is still, by the way, very true. That hasn't made a big difference. Who plays that? His name is Chris Durang. He's a writer and, and oh. a younger writer. But you see, the thing is that I'm not. I think that's a wonderful play. I've seen it. It's a very enjoyable play, but it's a very commercial play. And the only reason those three theaters did it is because they really see a commercial future, not only on Broadway, but there's a potential movie, there's a potential television thing, it can probably have a big European career, and they all get a slice of the writer's percentage. So they made an investment. When they apply for a grant next year, they can say, we originated American film, and we are making so much of an income from American film, they immediately get more grant money. This is the biggest joke in the world. This is absolutely yeah. true. 
And this, this is the whole routine of it. So the thing is that, 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 that the same kind of cowardice that, in, that we were complaining about in commercial producers, who do have something to lose, by and large, by the way, uh, the same kind of cowardice applies in the regionals where there is nothing to lose. Because I have seen, I cannot think of the new American play that will bore an audience as much as some of the classics I have seen done. Not that the classics themselves are boring, but the thing is that when you have an American actor, w an American actor has a hell of a time with Shaw or with Shakespeare most of the time. They could connect with John Guerre or with Albert Inarado. They cannot connect most of the time with Shakespeare. So you dress them up in drag, you put them in uh, wheelchairs, you do it in black and white. You know what I mean? In other words, you, you destroy the classic, you distort it. We've seen productions recently in New York of that kind. You distort the classic, you destroy it, you undercut it, you do everything but deal with the text, and you don't do a new play. You see what I mean? And it becomes this horribly ugly, vicious circle. And most of their new playwrights programs, I, I'm totally jaundiced about, I'm totally cynical about. They give, you, they give you their worst actors, their worst directors, the least support, you're put in the back lot, and they collect a lot of money. They will go crazy trying to get the playwright to, to rob the playwright. In other words, they will, they will say, there's some of these theaters do new playwrights programs, but they will make the playwright pay for his own transportation, or they'll give you the most minimal amount of money. They'll give you the least cooperate, cooperation in terms of any kind of work on your play. They will demand some kind of subsidiary right, and they will collect an enormous grant. What's the alternative that? to all of this? I thought that <laughs> there must be something in between. I don't know what it is. It really is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a ridiculous situation. It's dreadful. Jo uh, John, I mean, John has been uh, has a long yeah, lived in the theater. Two of the most widely admired, successful, I'm talking now in terms of esteem, not appraising your economic returns, uh, playwrights, talk of a really disastrous situation that is mobilized against the manifestation of their work rather than in support of it. What is the alternative? I don't know, because I don't know how people get their place. It's a real nightmare. I feel very lucky, I mean, ha uh, having had two plays done at the Academy Festival in Lake Forest by Bill Gardner, and now being connected to the public theater. Well, obviously, that is always part of what we refer to as the creative process. If it's a book or a film or a, w a work of visual art, the agonies uh, bear little resemblance to that one glorious opening night or date of publication. Perhaps you might tell us, in terms of the anatomy of a play, particularly since uh, Landscape of the Body has already been called a masterpiece, what happens to a play from its first production in Lake Forest and let's use Landscape of the Body, if you will, as an example to its opening in New York. Do you travel with a show? Do you have an opportunity to rewrite? Once the material gets in the hands of a director, how much control do you have left? Fine. I mean, you wouldn't pick the director. I mean, you wouldn't work unless you felt before you started rehearsal that the two of you could work together and were after a common goal. And uh, luckily on this play, there's been very, very minimal reworking of it. I mean, we knew what we wanted. We did our work before. And then we made some cuts. And when did it open in uh, Lake Forest? Yeah, it played the month Perhaps of July. It mm -hmm. played the month of July. It was because Joe Papp said that after Marco Polo opened, he said, well, just hurry up and bring a new play in. And I said, well, I don't want to waste his time. Because again, I'm a Rockefeller on a grant at the, at the festival this year. And I didn't. I said, OK, I'm here. I'm going to use it. And, he's just, and so I wrote the play the day after. I finished the play the day after Marco Polo closed. How long and did it take you to write that play? Uh, it was written in two. First, it was written in two days, but I mean, there was a lot of work beforehand. But it was well, a, it obviously, was I guess most things that one writes is uh, an expression of the culmination of one's life at any point in time. Yeah. And so we went, and then I, Bill Gardner came by and read it, and he said, I'll do it. It seemed, you know, and we see who he said, Would you like one? I said, I really would love Shirley Knight, because I'd seen him in Kennedy's Children. And again, a play that had a long uh, European life before it came back to America. And, um, that's uh, how it got to America, from yeah, London, yeah. wasn't it? Had but it had yeah, a very, had shor yes. very short life here, didn't it? Yes. But, but it very it well received in London. Yeah. Yeah. Europe. And why, uh, do, why? Because of the nature of the subject matter? It was a very raw, tough play. Why, why, why did it not get on in America? Why did it have to go to Europe? Yes. Well, because I don't, I don't think there's any interest in new plays. I think there's an important no, play. That's right. It's an, it's an important play. I mean, one can like or not like that play. The point is that it's an important, significant play that deals seriously with a situation we all know, and no American producer would touch it. And then, uh, then when it was went to London and, and, and to Europe, it had an enormous success in Europe. And then it would, but see, Broadway is, is a big risk. Broadway is always a risk. Whether a play goes on Broadway has nothing to do with whether it's a good play. It has a lot to do with 
the timing because it's a commercial market. It's a marketplace. It depends on the, the. It's like a television show. A television show can be quite wonderful and bomb in the ratings because it's the wrong time for that. And and as soon as you're on Broadway and charging fifteen dollars a ticket, you're in the same market. There has to be something right about the play for people to want to go see it. My and safe. I mean, that's why I think that it is very accurate right now that it is Richard Kiley coming back in Man of La Mancha or, you know, Yul Brynner in King and I, because they are like products. I mean, you know, because it's a lot of money, 20 bucks or something, that you know what you're getting for your money. And I mean, even a straight play, and not for a straight play in, in a moderate theater, modest-sized theater, which I tell you from experience, is, is $25,000 a week. That's a lot of money to have to make every single week. It certainly is. So a commercial, and I mean, uh, there's a, the most successful movie, uh, the, most, the most successful musical on Broadway right now is $120,000 a week. For is that chorus line? No, for Annie. That's the nut, as far as I know. It's $110,000. It's an enormous, enormous Let's amount Let's get of back money. to drama for a moment. With bearing the economics in mind, which can only get progressively more intense or worse, what do you see as the future direction of drama? Where will plays be produced? You always find a place to do that. That's the worst of it. I mean, you'll find places them to be done. I would just like to say one parenthesis about regional theaters is, is that I've been, again last spring, I've been feeling, been very, very depressed about my own work and went inadvertently to Providence, Rhode Island, was, was doing a play of mine. And Which it was play was Rich that? and Famous, and it was done in such an original way. I, I, it was done exactly the way I had wanted it. I, when I say original way, it was done with such life and it was that I felt that the play was given back to me for the first time. I really felt I had lost the play was something I had almost stepped away from. I didn't understand my relation. I didn't understand why I had written it. And they showed me. I mean, they just did the play as I wanted it to be done. And it was without my having been there. And that was quite an extraordinary experience. And I must say, I took an enormous amount of energy, quite surprising amount of energy from that. And this other play, Marco Polo Sings the Soul, is being done by American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, the Bill Ball Company, this winter. And I must say, for regional theater, I mean, here's two plays that after they closed in New York, I was surprised at a place in Providence or in San Francisco taking a play that the people came to see the play and liked the play and just said, we want to do that play. And so that I find quite extraordinary. I mean, it's a change. It is something that there is a change, some kind of change happening. I can always hope it gets better. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah, yes. What direction do you see drama taking? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I love the live theater, and I, you know, I would hope that there will always be a live theater. I think that there are lots of terrible problems which are not being faced up to by people who deal in theater. I went to a luncheon yesterday and, uh, of, of uh, theater critics and, and, and the people and was, was amazed at the kind of romanticism, this kind of evangelical romanticism that was going on, when in fact, uh, so long as there is very little concrete interest in new plays, so long as uh, the unions have... Evangelical enthusiasm for what? For, for, oh, yes. There's a, I mean, there's because a, it's the beginning of the season. The <laughs> season. But I think there's a very we start small... We I think there's a very <laughs> small audience. world is invented again. I think the audience for plays is small. I think that the prices of producing you a play... You think the audience is small? Yes. Don't you find it increasing and no, increasing? No, no. What about all those statistics? I don't. I don't believe them. I mean, you I think I they're think for grants too, rather than facts. I don't know. Stand. I don't know. I think it's a small audience. No, I'll tell you. Something. I went to see Liv Ullman in Anna Christie last mm -hmm. week, and I met the mother of a girl I'd gone to grammar school with. And I said, "Oh, how are you? I hadn't seen her since grammar school." She said, "You know, this is the first time I've been to the theater in 25 years, but I want to see that Liv Ullman, and I'd pay anything to see her." And it's exactly that. I mean, that woman finally, you know, she would spring the money. To see Liv Ullman. But once re involved in the theater, you But no, it's not re involved. Works that you way. think it's, it's a one shot? Not at all. Oh, no. She went to Thanks. see it, and that was that. Now, people come to Gemini, who, I mean, to my play, because, they, because it deals with something that they've gone through. But that doesn't mean they, go, they come back next week. They may, may or may not like my play. But Do the you thing think is it's then part of the responsibility of the playwright to help develop this new audience? How can the playwright develop it? What can you do? You have to face it. There is a small audience, really. That's really what you face as a playwright. You may be lucky, you may hit. You know, make a killing, but, but and, and may tap that the available audience, but it's a small audience in general. It's often been said that most writing is autobiographical. Is that a cliche or is that fact? What do you think? <laughs> what do I think? I think everything is autobiographical. The <laughs> what do you think? You know, I'll, I'll quote Barbara Lee Diamondstein. I admire your judgment. <laughs> <laughs> How did you ever focus on writing plays? You mentioned the name earlier of Christopher Durang. Did you ever co-author something, co something with him? him yeah. Isn't that a difficult? Uh, well, no. We were very friendly, and it was mostly a joke. We had we were friendly at the time, and we were at Yale, 
and we would sit around in the dining room and um, there's nothing to do at Yale, really. And so, and so we would sit around and joke, make terrible jokes, and we had the very same sense of humor. And that, that little thing we did came out of that. It was not... And what was that little it's thing? It's called The Idiot's Karamazov, but it's not... Uh, it's not, it's not seriously intended, it's just a joke. It's a, soft, it's a college joke, you know, and on that level it's amusing. It's not a, it's not a particularly good play. Can you imagine co-authoring a play with anyone at this stage of your career? No, it was lots of fun. Collaborate, it, you, could, you could have a lot of fun collaborating. I mean, collabora collaborating is fun, so I mean, One sure. thing to do it over the dinner table or in yeah, the living room, I mean, and another thing in a serious and professional production. Yeah, and there's a substantial difference between that and his work or my work. I mean, that's a very... John, how did you ever focus on writing plays? I often think of you as not only a playwright, but a great musician and songwriter. Uh, I always wrote plays. I wrote when I was I, 11, I wrote my first plays. And, and what were, was that about? I have no idea. They were done in a, in a garage, and Newsday came and took pictures of us. An 11-year-old playwright. And that seemed to be... Well, you are from Long Island. Originally. Queens, yeah. Jackson Heights. And what was... You don't remember the title, the play, Nothing. the subject, no. the production? Lost to History. Lost to what History. What was your first play? Similar, as interestingly enough. I was very young, 11 or 12. I wasn't photographed by Newsday. But we I called them up, that's why I wrote <laughs> to get my name in the paper. We Isn't that funny? No, but I started very early, too. We told them we were going to give the money to the orphans, you see, so they came. Ah ha 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 recently I wrote for television. And what was that? It was, it was, it was <laughs> that road, you see. I mean, it's already showing. I, I had Edwin uh, Newman. <laughs> that's funny. He hasn't heard you. Uh, but uh, no, it was a disastrous experience, but I wanted the money, so that's why I did it. Is that the motivation in that instance? Of course, of course. You know, play, I mean, I... But I'm again, you talk about audiences. You couldn't have, you know, a much broader gauge yeah, audience. Yeah, uh, that's where I think if there is a future for, for any kind of, of quote-unquote dramatic writing, I think it's in television, if there is a future. Would you agree with that? Because that's, that's no. an enormous audience. I don't understand television at all. Well, I mean, the thing is that, of course, there are lots of... I mean, the whole commercial process is so awful, but there's a potential for them. Thank you. I'm afraid that we've just been told that that's it for now, but a very special thanks to John Guare, the author of Landscape of the Body, Albert Inarato, the author of the new Ulysses in Traction. It was a very real privilege to have both of you. Thank you, Bob. It was fun. Good. And thank you, audience, for being with us, too. And is that, is that how we yeah. finished? Okay. Yes, oh, that was fine.